worshiping during storms. Is it possible to worship God when there is no food on the table, when there is no money, when the relationship is not going well, when things at home are not right? Is it possible to go to church, to sing with joy, and to praise the Lord? Let us bow our heads before we begin. Father in heaven, have mercy upon me and have mercy upon th those who are listening to your word. And Father, may you speak to us. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Worshipping during storms. Our key text is found in Job chapter 1 verse 20. The Bible says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. This text says that then Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down to the ground and worshipped. So something happened that led him to worship. Something happened that led him to rent his mantle, to shave his head, to fall down to the ground and to worship. What happened? Many of you know this story. Job chapter 1, verse 1. Now, the book of Job was written by Moses when he was in the wilderness before Jesus appeared to him in the burning bush. It is there where he wrote the book of Genesis and he wrote the book of Job. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Now when many people read this, the Bible says that Job was blameless. What does this mean? Does this mean that Job never made a mistake in life? Does this mean that Job was perfect? If you have your Bibles, 1 John chapter 1 and verse, let us begin in verse 8. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8 says, verse 8 to verse 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I'll share a couple of verses before I explain that. Verse 14 of 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 14. That is just the before the book of 1 John. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and without blameless. So what does it mean to be blameless? A person who is blameless is someone who has been convicted of their sins, someone who has repented and confessed, has accepted Jesus as their personal savior, someone who has been baptized, someone who has received the Holy Spirit. It, it, it does not mean that after you have become converted, after you have accepted Jesus, that you will not make a s commit sin, that you will not make a mistake in life. What it does mean to be blameless is that from now on, you do not seek to sin. From now on, you hate evil. You hate sin. Those who are blameless are those who are blameless in heart. Those who seek to do God's will. Those who seek to glorify God. Those who seek to obey God's word. But because of this carnal flesh, because of the fight from within, at times in life, they will make a mistake. They will sin. But it is not because they decided that or they said to themselves, this is God's will, but I want to do it this way. I don't want to obey God. I want to disobey God. Those who are blameless are those who are pure in heart. They seek to do God's will. They seek to keep God's commandment. But because of their flesh, at times, they will sin, but not 
intentionally. At times, they may even do things knowing that they are wrong, but God is faithful and just to forgive us. There was a time I went to Mall of Asia, and I went to buy clothes with a cousin. And at around 12 or 1, I, I was hungry, and I wanted to get something to eat. Now, I'm a vegetarian, and it was very difficult to find a place where I could find the type of food that I eat. And finally, we went into a restaurant, and as I looked at the menu, I was just looking for any plate or anything that had a lot of vegetables on it. And uh, finally, I found one, and I also got some soup. And in the soup, well, it there were on the picture, there were vegetables. And so I asked uh, the person who was attending us, and I, uh, and I asked the lady, and I said, are these vegetables? She said, yes, all of it, yes. So I ordered, I prayed, of course, and we began to eat. But as I was eating, I noticed that there was meat in the plate or in the bowl of soup. So I asked her and said, sorry, wh what is this? I asked for vegetables only. And she said, that is pork. If you have your Bibles, come with me quickly to Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 11. We'll begin... In verse 1, sorry, okay, I'm there. Chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Verse 1 tells us that the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron to tell the Israelites. So what we are about to hear does not come from Moses and it does not come from Aaron, but it is coming from God. God spoke and told Moses and Aaron to tell the Israelites. Verse 3. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Verse 4. Nevertheless, these ye shall not eat among those that chew the cud, or those that have cloven hooves, the camel, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves, it is unclean to you. Jump with me to verse 7. And the swine, which is pork or pig, thou, though... It divides the hoof, having cloven hoofs, yet does not chew the cud. It is unclean to you. Their flesh ye shall not eat, and their carcasses ye shall not touch. They are unclean to you. So I had sinned against God. But I did not sin because I wanted to. I did not sin because I intended to go against God's commandments. But it was unintentional. But it was still a sin, so I had to confess it. If you look at Leviticus chapter 4, the Lord says, If an anointed priest sins, he must offer a sacrifice. If an anointed priest sins. Now an anointed priest is a converted uh, Christian. And God says, if he sins, he must offer a sacrifice. So being converted does not mean that you will not make a mistake. But because of this flesh, you will make a mistake. So when the Bible says that Job was blameless, it does not mean that Job never sinned. Let me just share another text with you before we proceed. Now this is in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. All right. Romans chapter 7 verse Let us look at verse 14 going down. Romans chapter 7 verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, meaning what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. 16. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present in me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. 19, verse 19. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I 
practice. Verse 20, now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. One more text I will share with you before we proceed on and read this amazing story of Job is in 1st John chapter 3 verse let us begin verse 1 and verse 2 we'll read those two verses 1st John chapter 3 verse 1 behold what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Meaning it is a blessing. It is a wonderful privilege to be called the children of God. It is a wonderful privilege to be able to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. Meaning as when you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, you become a child of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. God is not calling us at this moment to be, we are called to be Christ-like, not to be like Christ. We are called to be Christ-like. Now, I believe we can proceed. Being like Christ means you are perfect. You make no mistakes. You make no sin. And if you continue to read in 1 John chapter 3, it says that Jesus has no sin. He has never sinned. We will only be like Christ when Jesus comes. This is why Paul says, who will deliver me from this wretched body of sin? And then he goes on to say that when Christ appears, this mortal shall put on immortality. So we shall be like Christ when Christ comes and changes us. But as for now, we are Christ-like and not like Christ. Job chapter 1, verse 2. So verse 1 tells us that Job was blameless. We know now what that means. Job was upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Verse 2 says, And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Seven plus three, that equals ten. So Job had ten children. Verse 3 says, Also his possessions were seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the earth. Amazing. Job was abundantly blessed by the Lord. While well, he had many children, he had many houses, he had oxen, he had, he had animals, he had everything that a person would need, and most importantly, he had God. And proof of that, if you continue to read, is actually in verse 5. But let us look at verse 4. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So his seven sons would hold feasts in their houses. They would have a feasting cycle. For example, today they would feast in the house of the older brother, tomorrow in the house of the younger, and they would go on until they feasted in everyone's house and they would invite their three daughters. Verse 5 says, So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. This means he would offer burnt offerings for each and every one of them. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. So Job was a man of prayer. Job was someone who was constantly spending time with God. 
Now, if you come with me to verse 6, the Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Verse 7, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come from? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. What the devil was telling God is that, well, I'm coming from the earth, I'm walking on it. In other words, I am ruling it. I am controlling the world. I am doing as I please. I walk to and fro on the earth. I walk up and down. I do what I please, and I'm causing mischief. Verse 8, the Bible says, Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Satan, in verse 9, says this. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Verse 10. Have you not made a hedge around him? around his household, and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. So the devil tells God that the reason why Job worships you, the reason why Job, why Job is faithful to you, is because you have blessed him. In other words, Job does not come to you because he wants you, but Job comes to you because of what you have given him. There are many of us who seek God not because we want God. We seek God because we want what God can give us. We, we only come to God when we need something. In fact, we don't even go to church to worship God. We go to church for other reasons. So the devil says, the reason why he's blameless, the reason why he shuns evil, is because you have blessed him. It is because you have given him something. Job is not faithful because he wants you. He wants a relationship with you. And by the way, Jesus does not call us so that he may lavish us with, with material blessings. Jesus does not call us to give us things. Jesus calls us because he wants to give himself to us. Jesus calls us because he wants to have a genuine relationship with him. That is why he calls us. If you continue to read in verse 11, the devil says, But now... Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. So the devil says, you remove now everything he has, all that you have blessed him, and you will see that he will curse you. An interesting thing, the Lord responds in verse 12. The Bible says, and the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The devil had actually asked God to strike Job. But God said, no, I will not do that. I give you permission. I give you authority to go and tempt Job. There's a quotation I want to share with you. Ellen White says, nothing can happen in any part of the universe without the knowledge of him who is omnipresent, and that is God. Not a single event of human life is unknown to our maker. While Satan is constantly devising evil, the Lord our God overrules all, not some, all, so that it will not harm his obedient. Now pay attention to the words in red. Trusting children. The same power that controls the boisterous waves of the ocean can hold in check all, all the power of rebellion and of crime. God says to one as to the other, 
Thus far shalt thou go and no farther. There is nothing that happens in this world that God is not aware of. God is omnipresent. He sees everything. He knows what is happening. And when you are facing a difficulty, God has not become blind and God has not become deaf. God knows what is happening. He knows what is coming toward you. He knows the plans that the devil has for you. And the Bible says that God will protect his obedient uh, followers. He will protect his obedient children. This does not mean that God will prevent the temptation from coming. This does not mean that God will not allow the difficulty to come in your life. I'll give you a couple of examples. Daniel, he was told not to pray anymore. And they said that if you continue to pray, we will throw you in the lion's den. Well, Daniel never stopped praying. They found him praying and they took him to throw him in the lion's den. They did that, but God kept him safe in the lion's den. God did not remove the lion. Instead, God kept Daniel inside the lion's den with the lion. Daniel's three friends, they were told that if you don't bow down and worship the, the, the image that was made, that we would throw you in the furnace. They said, we would rather die than disobey God. And if you cast us in there, God can save us from the fire. But even if we die, we die in the Lord and we are not afraid to die they took them they made the furnace ten times hotter they threw them inside the furnace but the Bible says that they never burned not even one hair on their head was burned they were not even smelling smoke but the Bible does say that the people who threw them in they were burned up because of the heat it was so intense the furnace was made ten times hotter God did not remove the fire, but God kept them inside the fire. When the Egyptians were coming out of, e the Israelites, sorry, were coming out of Egypt, going to the promised land, they, 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 they were being pursued by the Egyptians, and they came across the Red Sea, and they did not know what they would do, so they were complaining. Moses prayed. What did God do? Did God remove the Red Sea? Well, God made them go through the Red Sea. God did not remove the Red Sea, but they went through the Red Sea. There was another time they needed to cross the Jordan River. God did not remove the Jordan River, but God made a way through the Jordan River. God will allow those difficulties to come. But God will make us stronger so that we can bear those difficulties, so that we can go through them, overcome them. And through that, our faith will be strengthened. And one day you can look back and say, if God led me through the fire, if God led me through the lion's den, then I believe that today God is going to lead me. And once you focus on God, then you can worship during the storms of life. Now, if you continue to read this amazing story of Job, let us come to verse 2. No, 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 no. This is Job chapter 1, verse 12. Let us read verse 12. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And I'm sure he was very happy. He was going to go out, prove to God, well, uh, he thought that he was going to prove to God that Job only worships him because he wants something. That we human beings only come to God because of what God can give us. Verse 13 says, Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Verse 14, And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabines raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. 
Verse 16 says, While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep of the servants. Let us just stop here for a while. Now this second servant actually says that a fire of God came from heaven. So he's saying that God is the one who destroyed, um, he's the one who has caused this destruction, he's the one who killed the sheep. Verse 16 says, the fire from God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I alone have escaped to tell you. It was actually the devil who was causing fire to fall from up. So the devil has this power. He has power to do this. Verse 17 says that while he was still speaking, another also came. This is the third servant and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came. This is the fourth servant. Now we are in verse 18. And this fourth servant said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. 19. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. <coughs> Excuse me. And it fell on the young people. And they are dead and I alone have escaped to tell you. What would you do if this happened to you? Keep in mind that Job has not sinned. Job has not done anything wrong. The Bible says he's blameless and upright and he loses everything in one day, including his children. He loses everything. What would you do? Would you go to church the next Sabbath? Would you go to, to, to Vespers if this happened on a Friday morning? Would you attend midweek if this happened uh, on a Wednesday morning? Would you worship God after this? Well, people would tell you it's not possible. You cannot worship God. You cannot go to church when things are not right at home. Verse 20. Our key text. The Bible says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Verse 21 says, And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of of the Lord. Verse 22, in all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. In all this, Job did not sin, nor did he charge God with wrong. He did not blame God, but instead he worships God and he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord has taken I mean, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. How was this possible? Well, the secret is actually found in verse 5. Job chapter 1 verse 5 says, So it was when the days of feasting had run their course, this is the feasting cycle that his sons had, that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Job was a man of prayer. Job was not only worshipping God when this calamity happened. God was worshipping God way before this happened. God was seeking Job, was seeking God. He wanted God and not what he had. So when he lost his possessions. He was not really worried that he lost the oxen as long as he still had prayer. When they told him that his sons had died, of course he was sad. 
These were his sons. He loved them. And verse 5 reveals to us that he loved them because he would wake up when uh, after their feasting cycles and early in the morning offer burnt offerings. So he was sad that they died. But Job loved the Lord more than he loved his sons. Job sought God more than anything else. So to him, losing God was the worst thing that could ever happen to him. To Job, going a day without prayer, a day without communicating with God, that would be a disaster. If you come with me in chapter 2, chapter 2, same book. Verse 1 says, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also among them came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Now you would think that maybe by now the devil is embarrassed and he, is no, he would no longer come again. But he actually came again. Verse 2. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So again, he tells God, well, I've been busy, very busy. I've been causing mischief. I, I own the world. I'm walking up and down on it. It is mine. Verse 3. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He says, yes, you have been causing mischief in the world. But have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And still he holds fast, he holds fast to his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So God tells Job, tells the devil, I have proved to you that it is possible for humans to come to me because of who I am. To come to me because they want to have a relationship with me. It is possible for humans to keep the law. It is possible for humans to remain faithful during difficult times. It is possible for humans to worship me during the storms. Every story in the Bible reveals God's plan to us. And it reveals God's goodness. And the devil hate the Bible with all his strength and with all his might. And I believe that he hates this story more than many stories in the Bible. Because this story reveals to us that it is possible to be faithful to God during difficult times. It is possible to worship God when things do not seem right. When we are being persecuted. When we are being mistreated. It is possible possible to worship God and remain faithful verse 5 the devil says no verse 4 so Satan answered the Lord and said to him skin for skin yes all that a man has he will give for his life so he says okay you were right he loved you more than he loved his possessions but now touch his skin touch his body touch him I am sure that he will curse you after you touch him. Verse 5. The devil says, But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. Do this now, and he will curse you to your face. Verse 6. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand but spare his life. Now, if you have noticed, the devil is actually telling God to do it. He's telling God, you touch him, you afflict him. But the Lord says to Satan, in verse 6, the Bible says, and the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. You touch him. I'm not going to touch him. Verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. I hope you see the image. 
Job did nothing, as I have told you. He, he has not sinned. He has not done anything wrong. But he's suffering. And Job does not know of this conversation, of this great controversy. Oh, he is aware of the great controversy, but he doesn't know what's happening now at this time. That God is, is, is allowing the devil to tempt him. So, verse 7 says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Verse 8, And he took for himself a potsherd with, with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Job took a pot, and he took that pot, and he would scratch himself. It was itchy. So he would scratch himself with that pot, and it was painful. Verse 9 says this. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. You know, at times, what hurts us the most when we are hurt, it is not so much as what happened, but it's what hurts us the most is that the people who hurt us are the people we least expect that would do something to us. It, it, these are the people usually that we count on. And when they hurt us, that is just a terrible feeling. When, when a parent would hurt their child, the child just feels um, terribly, he, he feels terrible that this is the person whom is supposed to love me the most, but yet this is the person who hurts me. It could be a best friend. It could be a brother, a sister, a parent, uh, a brethren from the same church. These are the people that you would expect not to hurt you. These are the people you expect to love you the most. These are the people you expect when you are facing difficulties. You expect them to encourage you. But often, they are the ones who hurt us. And it's not the situation we find in that hurts us the most. Sometimes, it's the people that hurt us. That is what disturbs us the most. How can my wife do this to me? How can my husband do this to me? How can my, my brother from the same church do this to me? Well, his wife, instead of encouraging him, told him, why do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Well, in verse 10, the Bible says, But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Praise the Lord. It is possible to worship during storms. It is possible to hold on to God when things are rough. But you can only do that when you have already been holding on to God before those storms. When you already have a prayer life before those storms. And when you enter those storms, by that time, God has already given you strength. God has already given you the endurance to go through those difficulties. Verse 11 says, Now when Job's three friends heard all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz the Tamanite, Bildad the Shushite, and Zophar the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. Their intention was to mourn and to comfort him in this difficulty. Verse 12 says, and when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days 
and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. So his friends hear of what happened to him. And the Bible says they come because they wanted to comfort him. But when they saw him from afar, they began to weep. And they came close to him and they sat beside him and they spoke no words for seven days. They just mourned with him. Nor did Job speak to them also. Can you imagine? For seven days, they just sat there with him, observing him and Job in pain. Some people think that this suffering of Job only took one day. He lost everything in one day. And then at the end of the day, the Lord restored everything. This went on for a very long time. And after these seven days, we will not, we will just look at a couple of verses. And then we will finish in the last verses or in the last chapters of the book of Job. Chapter 3 of Job, verse 1 says, And this, Job, after this, sorry, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. After the seven days of, of mourning, of keeping quiet, him and his friends, the Bible says that Job arose and he cursed the day of his birth. He did not curse God. He did not curse God, but he cursed the day of his birth. Let me read what Job says. Verse 2, And Job spoke and said, May the day perish on which I was born. And the night in which it was said, a male child is conceived. May that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor the light shine upon it. May darkness and shadow of, of, and the shadow of death claim it. May a cloud settle on it. May the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, may darkness seize it. May it, he's talking about the day of his birth, May it not rejoice among the days of the year. May it not come down into the number of the months. And you go on reading until verse 10. He refers to the day of his birth and he curses the day of his birth, but he does not curse God. He does not blame God. And he says, as, as he said in uh, chapter 1, he says, naked I came into this world, naked. I shall return. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken. And if you look at verse, I believe chapter, chapter 14 verse 1, Job says that man who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. For as long as you are in this world, you will face trials and difficulties. And that is what Job says. He says that man born of woman is short of day short of days, but he's full of trouble. So for as long as we live in this world, there will be trials, there will be persecution, and there will be difficulties. Now, after this, his friends arise. And I hope you can see this picture. His friends arise, and they begin to say, to condemn him. For example, in chapter 4, verse 7, this is Eliphaz, the, the Tamanite speaking says, Remember now, whoever perishes being innocent, or were the upright ever cut off? Were the upright ever cut off? Verse 8. Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. So he was telling Job, You have sown iniquity and now you are reaping iniquity. What is happening to you is happening to you because you have been wicked. You have sinned against God and that is why you, you are facing difficulties. This is why this has happened to you. This is why you face calamities because you have disobeyed God. I'll read another text and he goes on to say in chapter 5 verse 17, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. Verse 18, for he bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. He shall deliver you in six troubles. Yes, in seven, no evil shall touch you. Now, 
what his friend said is true. The Lord does chasten us. He does correct us. And the Lord sometimes will bring things to us, certain difficulties to teach us to depend on him, to teach us lesson. As a father corrects his children, so does the Lord. Uh, the Lord does the same with us. This is true. But Job has not sinned. So this was not for Job. Now you look at chapter 6. Job answers in verse 14 and he says, To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. Job here was expecting his friends to comfort him, to encourage him. But instead, they are beating down on him. They are beating him down and they are telling him, you have sinned, you have transgressed, and God is punishing you. God tell, Job tells them, I have not sinned. I have been righteous. They tell him, no, only those who are wicked suffer. If you were righteous, you would not be suffering. You are suffering because you are wicked. You are facing trials and difficulties because you are wicked. I'll read a couple of more verses before we go down. Now, if you look at chapter 8, verse, verse, okay, verse, verse 1. Then Bildad the Shushite answered and said, How long will you speak these things? And the words of your mouth be like a strong wind. Does God subvert judgment or does the Almighty pervert justice? If your sons have sinned against him, he has cut them away, he has cut, cast them away for their transgression. So he tells them, your sons have died because they have sinned against God. Verse 5, if you would earnestly seek God, if you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now, he would awake for you and prosper your rightful dwelling place. So in verse 6, Bildad is telling Job that you are not pure and upright. Verse 6, I'll repeat. Job chapter 8 verse 6. If you were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for you and prosper your rightful dwelling place. So in other words, he's telling Job, because you are not pure and upright, this has happened to you. And Job is saying, no, I have been pure and I have been upright. And in chapter 10, verse 7, although you know that I am not wicked and there is no one who can deliver from your hand. Job continues to say that he has not sinned against God and that he has not transgressed God's law, but his friends keep telling him you have sinned and the proof that you have sinned is what has happened to you if you are not living a sinful life God would not have punished you God is correcting you and they did that for many days now if you come with me to the last chapters of this book of the book of Job I want you to go to let us look at verse chapter 39 no, 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 chapter 38, chapter 38. Now, by this time, they had vindicated Job, and Job had listened to them, and Job had, had, had he sought to explain to them that he was upright in heart, and that he did nothing wrong. But they never listened, and they continued. When you get to verse 2, chapter 8, God now interferes. And God speaks and makes all things clear and explains what happened. But before we do that, I want you to read a quotation. I want us to read a quotation by Ellen White in the book Education, page 156, paragraph 1. She says, according to this, to his faith, so was it done unto Job. When he hath tried me, he said, I shall come forth as gold. This is in Job chapter 23, verse 10. Job says, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You know, sometimes God will allow us 
to go through the fire so that we may be purified. He will allow us to go through the difficulty so that when we overcome, our faith may be strengthened. He, he, Ellen White goes on to say, by his patient enduring, by his patient enduring, he vindicated his own character. And thus the character of him whose representative he was. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Also the Lord gave to Job twice as much as he had before. So the Lord blessed the latest days of Job more than his beginnings. Isn't that amazing? What Job faced was not, God did not plan that Job would suffer. It was the devil's plan. But God did plan to prepare Job for what was coming ahead. God gave him strength. To endure hardship. God prepared him for what was going to happen. Now I encourage you. We don't have time to read Job chapter 39. Job chapter 40. I invite you to do that after you hear this sermon. Or when you have time. Find time to read this book. When we face difficulties in life. That is when the devil comes to us. And tells us that God is unfaithful. Don't go to church. Stop praying. Stop giving tithe. Don't bother with God anymore. You see he's not faithful. That is when he comes to us. But if you understand who God is. If you know him. Then you will not abandon him. I invite you to read Job chapter 39, chapter 40, chapter 41. In these chapters, God reveals amazing things that if you truly read this chapter with all your heart, you will not waver when difficulties come. As we close, I want to share this quotation with you. Ellen White says, Let us pray, not only for ourselves, but for those who hurt us and are continuing to hurt us. Look at the emphasis she makes. Pray, pray, especially in your mind. This means when you are walking, when you are working, whatever you are doing. Give not the Lord rest, for his ears are open to hear sincere. Are open to hear sincere, importunate prayers when the soul is humbled before him. So brothers and sisters, the Lord is waiting for us to call upon him when we are in trouble. But not only when we are in trouble, but before those trials, before those difficulties, we must maintain a connection with God. And when these problems come our way, Saturday morning, you will worship the Lord with joy, no matter what happened to you. You will remain faithful And you will hold on to Christ. Give yourselves to prayer. As we get closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Things will get worse. Things will get terrible. Things will just go from worse to... It will just get bad. And iniquity will abound. But those who seek God daily... Those who give themselves to Christ daily will overcome those difficult times. They will sleep during storms. They will believe during storms. And they will worship the Lord during storms. I pray that after hearing this message, that you may seek to have a deeper connection with God. That from now on, you may not allow anything to interfere your worship with God. That from now on, you will not allow anything to ruin your quality time with God. You know, during the week, the devil seeks to disappoint you so that when the Sabbath comes, you are not ready to receive the blessings of the Lord. Some of us focus on our assignments. Some of us are worried of things we could not accomplish during the week, so we can't wait for the Sabbath to end. But let us look forward to the Sabbath and let us prepare for the Sabbath at the end of the Sabbath. Let us start preparing for the Sabbath on Sunday. 
Let us prepare our hearts to meet the Lord. Let us give ourselves to prayer. Let us give ourselves to the word of God so that when the Sabbath comes, we may worship in the middle of storms. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for explaining your word to us. Have mercy upon me, Father, and have mercy upon those who have heard your word. I pray, Father, that you may fill them with your Holy Spirit so that when the evil desire comes to deny you, to reject you, to curse you, to blame you, that your Holy Spirit may convict us as the Bible says that the spirit is against the flesh and the flesh is against the spirit, that we may not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So Father, we plead for your Holy Spirit so that it may help us in not fulfilling the desires of the flesh so that we may be blameless and upright in heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.